Good morning. Good morning. I'm Christine Montemat, and on behalf of Cultivate BTS and Justice and Reconciliation Society here at the seminary, and the Creation Care Committee of the Diocese of Virginia, I'm happy to welcome you to this conference to love, heal, and bless creation. Let us pray. May our ministries for the earth be holy, and may our work enable the next generations, all peoples and all species, to inherit a thriving, sustainable, and spiritually aware planet. Fill us with warmth, love, and care for this world you entrusted us. As we endeavor, in your name, amen. Amen. A show of hands, please. How many of you have experienced some effect of climate change? Hmm. I see you are awake. <laughs> <laughs> Thirty years ago, Wendell Berry wrote this Our destruction of nature is not just bad stewardship, or stupid economics, or a betrayal of family responsibility. It is the most horrid blasphemy. It is flinging God's gifts into his face, as if they were of no worth beyond that assigned to them by our destruction of them. We have no entitlement from the Bible to exterminate or permanently destroy, or hold in contempt anything on the earth, or in the heavens above it, or the waters beneath it. We have the right to use the gifts of nature, but not to ruin them or waste them. The Bible leaves no doubt at all about the sanctity of the act of world making, or of the world that was made, or of creaturely or bodily life in this world. We are holy creatures living among other holy creatures in a world that is holy. We are holy creatures living among other holy creatures in a world that is holy. Today, members of the Creation Care Committee will present two workable workshops the C3, as our younger generation calls us, rather than the Creation Care Committee, is a volunteer operation. It's been in the, at work in the diocese as a task force for a number of years. This past November, a large new group of members came on board. We jumped right in preparing for this conference which is to say we are just beginning. We're not at full power yet, and to get there, we need you. We currently have three working groups, which have been meeting for several years. We are continuing the work of the past. These working groups are mostly community members, such as yourselves, people who care deeply but for some reason, don't wish to committee. You'll hear from all three working groups today, and we want to hear from you. I'm part of the Habitat Restoration Group, and we focus on how our churches can use their land responsibly to support God's gift of nature. After lunch, you'll hear from the Energy Efficiency Working Group. Buildings account for about 30% of planet warming greenhouse gas emissions. So everything we can do to reduce that will save money, will save suffering, and will save lives. 
Our closing session today will be led by the Spiritual Resilience Group, which hosts an annual webinar and two book reading groups a year during Lent and the season of creation, as well as doing this work at church. Do try all of this at home. We hope today will begin conversation between all of us, people and parishes. <clears throat> the beginning of a long and beautiful relationship as we lean into loving, healing, and blessing God's creation. All of creation, all generations, all people, all species. We want to be connected if as many hands make light work. This work is not small and it can feel overwhelming. All of us presenting today are aware that we are only speaking to a few of the challenges. And that's okay. To paraphrase Bishop Curry, we can't do everything all at once, but we can do something. Going forward, we, the committee, want to incorporate more work on environmental justice, which addresses the harms done to marginalized communities, for example, by hazardous waste and resource extraction, the downstream of our modern ways of living, the long-term injuries of industrialized environmental damage, in marginalized communities are now multiplied by climate change. We are here for the future. I would like to uh, introduce a special guest uh, from the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, Dr. Gwen McRae, who is the Environmental Justice Coordinator for Northern Virginia. And she is at work, so you can talk to her. <laughs> and now I'm very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Father Jamon Taylor, joining us today from Raleigh, North Carolina. Father Jamon led St. Ambrose Church through a remarkable process of adaptation to the adaptation to the burdens of environmental injustice. Please welcome Father Jamon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Wonderful to be with you today. Um, thanks to the Diocese of Virginia, to the Virginia Theological Seminary, Seminary uh, for all of those who are present at this conference. Uh, wonderful being with you. Uh, special word of gratitude to Lo, who has been so hospitable in the weeks leading up to this conference. And last night he made some comments about the roots of environmental justice and how uh, a, a branch of that comes out of North Carolina. You, you referenced Warren, Warren County. Actually, I'm from Franklin County in North Carolina. And Warren County is the adjacent county. It's where my mother's family is from. And so as a child, I remember that movement as, as it was getting some steam as a child. Um, uh, there was an industry that wanted to produce or zone an area for waste management to turn it into a landfill, mostly black community. And so the black residents came together and actually fought off uh, this waste management company and so in the late 80s, we started recycling before it was cool. Uh, yeah. and we'd have to almost drive an hour to a recycling center because there was not one um, in, in my county, Franklin County, which was a rural county. So my talk today is on baptized in dirty water, this confluence between environmental injustice and racism. And so I come across this title from um, a hip-hop artist, those at St. Ambrose will tell you that I'm a student of hip-hop. Uh, I will often quote rappers in my sermons. And so one rapper I quote is, is David Banner. He's on the left. He produced an album 
called Baptized in Dirty Water. And he talked about his friends coming to uh, the state of baptism, giving up drugs, um, and then once they're baptized, returning to the practices that they wanted to give up, even though they were new in Christ. And he called that baptized in dirty water. And though he's not a theologian, he was making a deeply theological statement. To the right, you see an Ethiopian icon of the baptism of Jesus. I am a student of Ethiopian Christianity. I call it indigenous African Christianity. It's Christianity on the African continent um, before uh, contact with European slave traders and colonialists is what I call Christianity without the yoke of white supremacy. So even in this Ethiopian Orthodox icon, you have Jesus who's baptized in dirty water. Many times you'll see uh, Eastern Orthodox icons of the baptism of Jesus and their fish in the water. Sometimes you will see keys. Uh, those may be the, the gates of hell, the keys to the gates of hell. It's even Jesus in the great theophany that we find in the Gospels of his baptism. He himself is baptized in dirty water. I want to talk about my context, which is St. Ambrose Episcopal Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. So we were founded in 1868, right at the end of the Civil War, by the same person who founded St. Augustine's University. Uh, there remain two historically black Episcopal universities, St. Augustine's in Raleigh, North Carolina, and Voorhees in Denmark, South Carolina. Where Father Smith came from New York City, part of Freedmen's Bureau for the Diocese of North Carolina, established at St. Augustine's for the education of those recently emancipated enslaved people, and he established St. Ambrose for Christian formation. When we were founded in 1868, we built a small carpenter Gothic church in Smoky Hollow. Smoky Hollow was where free black people lived during the institution of slavery. The neighborhood got its name because of its proximity to the Raleigh Gaston Railroad. The depot was right there, and so all of the noxious gases and fumes from these train smokestacks would flow into this low-lying area called Smoky Hollow. So though we don't have respiratory data from 1868, it is reasonable to assume that the black people in that neighborhood suffered more from respiratory disease than larger populations. Even the EPA in its 2021 study said that African Americans are almost 40% more likely to have respiratory impact because of where they live. They live close to highways or in areas uh, that have air pollution. And so that was our genesis. In 1898, a couple of things happened. Um, January 6th uh, is seared into our psyche, first as Episcopalians because it's the epiphany, but also what happened not too far from here in Washington, D.C. Um, and insurrection. Well, in 1898, in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, there was a successful insurrection. Uh, a white supremacist mob storms the governmental offices in Wilmington, North Carolina. They oust the duly elected mayor. They oust the duly elected town council and institute their own white supremacist mayor and white supremacist council, and then they go and burn the black community. Wilmington, North Carolina went from a, a city of about maybe 25 to 30% black to, uh, to less than 10% overnight. And so with that ride in, in white supremacy in North Carolina, we could argue nationwide, uh, a very conservative Democratic Party was elected to the North Carolina General Assembly. And one of the things that they did was institute color lines. Now Raleigh is unique because most cities, no matter uh, north or south, had a color line. Well, Raleigh had two color lines that made the city a quadrant. In three of those quadrants, white people could live and work. And one quadrant was where uh, black people could live and work. Uh, the other thing that happened in, in 1898 is that the General Assembly sold our land from under our church and they sold it to a cotton mill that wanted to build on our property. So in June of 1900, we physically lifted our church up, put it on logs, and rolled it a mile and a half south across two color lines to the newly designated black community. Now this is not a picture of St. Ambrose being moved, it's another church, but this is how 
buildings were moved. You just take the log, you pull the, the structure, and then once you finished at the back end, you put it um, on, on the front end. And so because of that, we physically moved our church closer to the black community. When you read the Dawson report from the 1901 uh, Dawson Convention, uh, the Archdeacon for Colored Work, Archdeacon Pollard said, the greatest thing St. Ambrose has done in the sh short 32 year history is to physically move the black church closer to black people. And so that's been a part of our DNA. We moved from Smoky Hollow to Shaw University, which is the oldest historically black college in the South. And there we remain, we remain until 1963-64. So this is an image of, of St. Ambrose, uh, the original church that was moved from Smoky Hollow uh, to Shaw University. Uh, this pitch was taken about 1963. A couple of things happened. Um, in, in 1963, our building, which was almost 100 years old, was in disrepair. In 1957, uh, the City Council of Raleigh designated a new neighborhood for black people to live. This was the first planned community for black people during segregation. And they picked the Walnut Creek wetland as the spot for this newly created black community. The issue with that is that it is where the city of Raleigh dumped raw sewage for 70 years. From 1887 to 1956, the city of Raleigh dumped raw sewage into the Walnut Creek wetland. And the same year that the city decided to dump raw sewage was the year that the city designated this area for black people to live. It also was a de facto dumping ground. So as my friend, the Reverend Dr. Harold Lewis of Blessed Memory uh, said, he visited St. Ambrose, Father Taylor looks like the city dumped sewage, they dumped garbage, and then they dumped Negroes. And so for the second time in St. Ambrose's history, we physically moved the black church closer to black people. This time we didn't move this building, we built uh, a different structure. And so this is just some, some zoom, uh, some drone footage of Rochester Heights, which was this, is this planned uh, black community in the Walnut Creek wetland. And so I already mentioned about how the Walnut Creek wetland is where the city uh, dumped raw sewage and garbage. One of the impacts um, from moving there is that there was flooding then and flooding remains. So I'll just talk a little bit about the wetland. The wetland uh, is really a marvel of nature. There are so many diverse plant uh, animals. We have uh, mink, top left mink. We did a capital campaign. One of my church members, who's always a, a kidder, says, Father Taylor, you don't need a capital campaign. Just let me take my gun and hunt some meat. That's <laughs> <laughs> all the money in the world. We're not, we're not going to bring your gun on this property. You're not going to shoot me. But me live in the Walnut Creek wetland. Um, you have deer. Why well, tell deer? You have um, ruby-breasted ruby -breast, uh, hummingbirds, great blue heron live in a wetland. And then the bottom left is, is lamprey, which is a saltwater, fresh, freshwater uh, uh, fish, begins in the Atlantic, swims upstream to the Walnut Creek wetland where it lays eggs and it returns back uh, downstream into the ocean. So saltwater, freshwater fish. All of this and more in the Walnut Creek wetland. This is an image of Rochester Heights this is the community uh, that the city zoned. You can see the elementary school Fuller. You can see St. Ambrose. Uh, the logo is, is near the church. And then this area, 39 acres um, for black people to live. So all of the rectangles and squares are parcels of land for either houses currently are or used to be. This is the floodplain. You can see the floodway, which is the blue at the top. That means it's always wet. At the, let's go back one. 
if you look on Waller, you see Bailey Waller, and I don't think my, you know, you can't see my, uh, kind of hard to see the corner. Anyway, uh, Waller, that uh, building, rectangular building near the top where it says tools, yeah. that is a church. That's a, um, I think it's a church of God, it's a denomination. That church is basically in the floodway. That means any any rain event is going to flood. You see all of these houses, and I'll go back one, uh, Bailey Drive, all of those rectangles used to be houses. These houses were washed off the foundation. I mean, it looked like Katrina. There are members of my congregation who were rescued by boats after rain events because their houses were washed off their foundation. These people were promised when they bought houses in the black community in 1956 that their homes would not flood. That's exactly what happened. Their homes flood, and their homes continue to flood today. You can see that the flood, the flood plain continues. So this would be in the south direction, this is south, um, into these people's properties, um, even, even today. Uh, there is a member of my congregation who says that her mother passed because of respiratory diseases because the house she lived in was always damp. It just could never, never get dry. Again, that's the 100 um, year flood plain map and then the floodway. And this is what Rochester Heights will look like. Now, granted, this is after a hurricane, so this is an extreme event. But it is not uncommon for these apartments to flood. Uh, this is the funeral that we that um, St. Ambrose had in front of our beloved members who died at age 42 from triple negative breast cancer. Uh, that type of breast cancer impacts black women more so than any, any other uh, ethnicity. And so the church was packed. We were more than 400 uh, people in attendance uh, at that funeral. And we had to cut the repast short and evacuate the church because this was happening outside. <laughs> Nearly all of the roads that led to St. Ambrose that day, that Saturday, looked like this. And so we made people leave I was the last to leave St. Ambrose, and had I not left at the time that I did, I would have been locked uh, into St. Ambrose because there was no way out via the road. Uh, this is the Walnut Creek watershed. You can see where St. Ambrose is, is located by the, the logo. And our, one of our biggest challenges now <laughs> is not related to climate change. We acknowledge that climate change exists. We do not deny that fact. But climate change is not our biggest issue as it relates to, flow, as it relates to flooding. It's what we call non-climate stressors. All of the development in that 46 square mile watershed where grass area is being paved over leads to more stormwater, which means all of that stormwater flows into Walnut Creek which flows right by my church. Short film. for young people, youngsters, children to begin uh, exploring, become nature oriented and uh, caring about protecting nature as a center point, preserving uh, those creatures that live and breathe just as we do. We need to create a destination park. <laughs> 
ends up he's rather in that park ought to be the Warner Creek Whitman Park and Center. What would happen to our communities if we didn't preserve and protect? Southeast Raleigh and the history of this part of the city. So I got to know the history of Rochester Heights as being the first kind of African American uh, residential development in the city. We're in a historical area for uh, African Americans. Here you have uh, Rochester Heights, which is one of the oldest ones, then you have built more in other communities that was built before the new uh, community. Partnerships have been a really important part of the story of carrying out Dr. Camp's vision. And this group of partners has really understood that nature isn't just some destination that, that we go off and visit. It's really an integral part of the community that we live in. And we started out as uh, Episcopalians for environmental justice. And we ended up partners for environmental justice. All of the members of our committee came to us because they were interested in help clean up this area and produce a park. They wanted to help this community become a better community, knowing that uh, integration had uh, set in. Uh, they, they were willing to join us. When I came to the first meeting, I could see black and white people working together kind of in equal measures, which was not very common at the time. And there were people from the neighborhood, and there were people from other congregations that were quite distant from this area. One of the themes that we actually talked about in, in regard to PEJ was that this is God's earth, and we are one with nature. And so we, we found that in teaching nature, we love nature more. And as long as we can get back into that relationship, then we are better for it. EJ's effort was to address the flooding in Rochester Heights, uh, pick up tons of trash from the wetlands. Welcome everybody 
today to our big sweep. is really about the nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations, uh, landowners, and government organizations. The city of Raleigh has become a really important partner in this work, and the park staff has worked really hard in the last few years to help make this vision a reality. Uh, what makes this place special? I would say, obviously, because it's an urban wetlands, and that is the unique aspect of this place. Not only that, but it's just beautiful. To everyone who did preserve this, I thank them greatly because they've given me an opportunity to find my own place in nature and able to realize that nature isn't far away. She's just right behind us and like I just thank them a lot. I feel good that we are here and that we are sitting in this building that we push for and get and this city. I feel good that, that we have succeeded. two weeks before he passed. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we had a chance uh, to get him uh, on film. And so when St. Ambrose moved to Rochester Heights, Dr. Camp, who was an environmentalist of PhD in chemistry by training, um, said we needed to do something. Actually, the way it happened, um, the rector at that time, who was Father Calloway, who served St. Ambrose for 40 years, four decades, uh, the Altigill directorate in about 1995 went to the rector, Father Calloway, and she said, I'm tired of my basement flooding. Do something. <laughs> uh, I imagine he said, well, I'm not uh, Moses. I cannot do the creek. But he turned to Dr. Kemp and said, Norm, do something. This is exactly what Norman Kemp did. And so it was the black residents who came together to help bring life, breathe life back into the Walnut Creek wetlands. You saw in the video, the big sweep. Um, yearly, today, even today, we go through and clean at least twice the Walnut Creek wetlands. You saw them pull out tires, 53 tons of materials pulled out between 2006 and 20, 1996 and, and 2017, thousands of tires. When they went to build the Walnut Creek Wetland Center, they were drilling to make, to plant stakes and kept hitting something. They thought it was rock. So they brought in excavators and it was a car graveyard. All of these cars buried. And so they had to pull these cars out before they could plant the stakes to build the foundation for the Walnut Creek Wetland Center. We pulled out autoclave. You know, autoclave, this is a scientific piece of equipment. People do not have autoclaves in their home. Autoclave <laughs> is, you know, could be the size of two refrigerators. Those were pulled out. All, all of, and even today, still pulling out tires. And so we helped clean up the wetland. Dr. Kemp was able to uh, get himself appointed to the Parks and Rec Board. And they worked hard to zone a 53-acre, a five-acre area into a 53-acre protected park. And so not only did we 
uh, put in sweat equity, but we also uh, made sure that we were part of, of the governmental side to provide pr protection for Walnut Creek. I'll just let this go. Thursday, the project will go before Molly's planning commission to look at rezoning multiple parcels for mixed use development and they'll decide doing so is in the public's interest. Historically, uh, black and brown communities have not been on the positive side of development. And so we don't want that history to repeat itself. The Reverend Jamon Taylor worries about his church as Walnut Creek runs right through the project's path. In a meeting last month, developer Key Realty said they're seeking the help of environmental agencies to manage that floodplain. If the development goes through with unmitigated stormwater, I am convinced that St. Ambrose will flood because it is only seven tenths of a mile upstream from Walnut Creek. And we all know that water flows down. <laughs> so in 2020, one of the largest developers in the Southeast, not Southeast North Carolina, Southeast, Southeast United States, Kane Realty, proposed this, a 145 acre development straddling Walnut Creek, only 3,000 feet upstream from St. Ambrose. And you do not have to be a stormwater engineer to know that if you take 80 acres of forested area and raise it and pave it, all of that water is going into the creek. Uh, these are some of the other metrics. $38 million square feet of new development, making it larger than downtown itself. Uh, several uh, hotels, a new stadium that would seat 20,000, and about 6.8 gallons per day of wastewater increase. This was the proposed development upstream from St. Ambrose. When I found myself in the meeting in August of 2020, in the pandemic, and hearing the developer put forth this plan, the person presenting when it, became to, when it came to stormwater said, there is no downstream flooding impact. Wow. <laughs> and he was an idiot. <laughs> he was serious. Mm -hmm. And so St. Ambrose was in the process of forming a new nonprofit, uh, a part of the Industrial Areas Foundation, IAF, New York Giants. We were just getting ready to found that organization after four years of conversation. And so I went to the board because I was on that board and I said, this is happening in my backyard, can you help? 90 days of organizing and talking to the press, as you saw there, and of getting buy-in from community members. We took those seven or eight words, there is no downstream flooding impact that was presented in, in August, September, 2020. And by the time the rezoning request went to the city council in December of the same year, there was a 1500 word document that outlined all of the stormwater considerations that, that are part of this development. And then we also work with the developer to get a $2.5 million grant matching fund from the developer's coffers. And though that funding would be used to help mitigate flooding in six flood prone areas downstream, downstream from the development site. So if we talk about flooding, not only do we have um, the development impact, but there's also a DOT, Department of Transportation impact. And I call this the Robert Moses effect. Many of you are familiar with the name Robert Moses, the Cross Bronx Expressway, this idea that if you want to decimate a community, you just put a road through it. And so once upon a time, once upon a time being 1992, Rochester Heights, which is to the north, uh, the 440 interstate came, and then the south is Biltmore Hill. So all of this was one black community. And if you were to visit, you could not make any distinction between Rochester Heights and Biltmore Hills. Technically, they were two different communities, but in practice, they were actually one big community. Well, Interstate 40 comes through, 
and bisects uh, the community. And then the slant or the cant of the road um, is toward already floodplain Rochester Heights. So uh, the DOT in bisecting this community also increased the possibility or added to the flooding impact. So as it relates to stormwater, if you take a, a parcel of land that is not developed in the rain incident, um, you will get a container of water for that rain incident as far as runoff. Once you pave it, 18 times that amount. So the increase is significant. And so the outcome of that development, as I mentioned, the downtown south, was that we had two groups from St. Ambrose. One was Partners for Environmental Justice, that was the group in the short film that St. Ambrose started in 1995 that began as the Episcopalians for Environmental Justice, but we changed because we found out that we needed to expand our partnership outside of the Episcopal Network. So PEJ and One Wake, which was that new community organizing effort that was founded in fall of 2020, came together and partnered with Kane Realty to make sure that the development as it went forward would have these stormwater considerations baked into the rezoning requirement. Let me talk more specifically about St. Ambrose. So St. Ambrose has had in its DNA um, environmental injustice and environmental racism baked in from its founding, 1868 in Smoky Hollow Respiratory. Then you fast forward to 1965, the building of the church in its current location, flooding. And so we always have, as a part of our questioning, how can we be more ecologically minded? What is the impact? So in 2016, St. Ambrose launched a capital campaign, a three-year capital campaign that was not ecologically focused from the beginning, meaning we did not set out to have an, an ecological capital campaign, but as we move through the campaign, that's exactly the way it shifted. And so uh, one of the things that, that we did is that we installed a couple of rain gardens um, to help take the water runoff, filter it before it grows or goes into Walnut Creek. We looked at our water usage, usage and we completely revamped our water system, um, allowing us to save or use 80% less water, primarily through um, changing our piping and toilets. We uh, put in water filter, water fountains, just like the one near the restrooms here, with counters, um, trying to decrease our bottled water usage. We installed um, low emissivity protective stained glass or, or protective windows on the exterior of the church, even though those windows were much more expensive than your regular windows. The church leadership thought it was important enough to install those windows to both protect the stained glass and to lower our energy consumption. Because what it does during the summertime, it makes the inside of the church uh, not as hot. There was a time at St. Ambrose on the stained glass windows, which faced west, before we installed that protective glass, you could not touch the stained glass. It was simply too hot and it served as a radiator. Now, it doesn't matter. And so in the wintertime, it actually uh, makes the church a little bit warmer and the, in the summertime, cooler. We increased the ampage on our HVAC system. The higher the ampage, actually the, the, the lower the energy consumption. So all of these, um, we redid our uh, installation. All of these things for our capital campaign, both interior and to our property, to make sure that we try to increase our ecological footprint. And even when we did um, some improvements external to the property, when we uh, built a new prayer garden and columbarium, Again, we want to make sure that we weren't paving. So we used um, permeable material, such as Chapel Hill brick, um, for the walkway. We installed uh, a new Ethiopian-inspired labyrinth. We wanted to make sure that that was uh, porous as well. So we used gravel for that. We also made 
the, the lanes of the labyrinth wide enough so that it's ADA compliant, so that those um, who have mobility challenges can make sure that the walker um, or wheelchair can navigate the lane. One of the things that it, that it did was it moved from a spiritual standpoint for those who have vision, it moved navigating the labyrinth from looking at your feet. Those who walk the labyrinth know, like a Sharps 12 circuit, you really have to look down because the, the lane might be 18 inches. But since the lane is 10 feet, you can lift your eyes and actually see what's around you because your periphery can help guide your path. Mountain Car Share Program, our rain garden will be about half the size it is now. But now at 500 square feet, it will collect twice as much stormwater runoff. So it's really a blessing that the city offers this opportunity. Dragonfly excavation came to make the rain garden possible. Uh, mulch has been laid. And so now it's time to add greenery to the brown mulch. We're here today to plant the rain garden, protect the wetland behind us. We're planting uh, some native plants, cardinal plants, black eyed Susan, and some grasses. A rain garden is very beautiful. So when you look at the rain garden, unless you know it's a rain garden, you think it is a regular garden. Something that collects stormwater does not have to look like a retention pond. Also, it helps beautify the campus. And as far as the community, it's an educational opportunity to educate the community about stormwater runoff, to the flowers and the plants that we will have in the rain garden. So it works not only for the church, but for the community at large. So we were able to work with the city of Raleigh that has a cost share program based on uh, watershed. And so we live in a watershed that has 75% reimbursement for any type of GSI, which is green stormwater uh, infrastructure. And so by working with the city, we're able to, because we have a particular grant, to double, as I said in the video, the size of our rain garden to one being nearly 600 square feet and almost spanning the entire width of our parking lot, taking water from the street parking lot and from the high pitch roof, collecting it um, in the rain garden. When the city of Raleigh came uh, and did the soil inspection, uh, Lori, uh, who's not in this video, but another one, said that St. Ambrose has baseball field grade dirt, meaning that the porosity of the, the, the ground is so high that it absorbs water at the highest rate than any other place they've measured in the city of Raleigh. And my response to her is, you're standing on holy ground. Yeah. What more do you expect? <laughs> Walnut Creek has been the site of environmental racism and degradation for decades. It's where the city of Raleigh dumped raw sewers for 80 years and garbage for 50 years. It was the place where city officials zoned during segregation in 1957 for black people to live. St. Ambrose was awarded the Episcopal Church's Creation Care Grant, receiving $24,000 for a three-phase project called the Healing Pod. The phases are a podcast, a labyrinth, and a therapeutic healing garden. Our podcast will reveal and report stories concerning St. Ambrose's response to environmental injustice in Raleigh's Black communities. This is Wading Deep, a podcast that explores the connection between environmental justice and race. And then when I came to North Carolina, there were a number of people who were advocating for the environment, many of whom are in St. Ambrose uh, right now, was in the lead on this. God's creation's power to heal us. I think all of us have had experience of, of the healing power of creation in different forms. So it's important to highlight the issues, um, but also understand that there are solutions, um, whether it's through green infrastructure or urban farming. The Labyrinth is a walking meditation and prayer garden that will refresh spirits. The Healing Pod was designed to reveal, refresh, and revive. The labyrinth is now completed. The third and as of yet unfunded phase of the project at St. Ambrose is designed to bring healing to our relationship with nature. Nature has been weaponized against marginalized people through forced labor, contamination, and deprivation. The gardens and programming that we have proposed for St. Ambrose 
will reunite people with their birthright connection to nature. God's creation has an ability to heal our spirits and revive our joy. Through our observation of and participation in the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth that is part of every day in the garden, we can build our tolerance for loss and increase our hope for the future. By engaging with outside spaces that are carefully designed to promote feelings of safety and wonder, our therapeutic gardens will bring God's people back home. Resilience, our strength of spirit and hand. Resurrection, our healing, may all we stand. In 2021, we received uh, the highest grant amount from the Episcopal Church for the project, the Healing Pod, which, as the video said, was in three phases, the Waiting Deep Podcast, the Ethiopian Inspired Labyrinth, and then the Healing Garden. So as I mentioned uh, at the top of my talk, I've been studying Ethiopian spirituality for at least two and a half decades. And if you go to St. Ambrose, there's so many aspects of Ethiopian spirituality that you will see in the worship context. Now, when people see this labyrinth, they say, Shimon, I guess you designed this and, and, and you told your people to go in that direction. It's actually not true. It shows the importance of, of setting the culture and then letting that seep in. This labyrinth was designed by a church member, and she came to me after the design was completed and said, we researched and found this Ethiopian-inspired labyrinth. We think you would like this. <laughs> absolutely right. I do like this. So I had no, no hand um, in, in that at all. The healing garden. So the, the third phase of the grant was the healing garden. When I came to St. Ambrose in September of 2012, I met Dr. Norman Kemp, who was featured in, in the video. And Dr. Kemp spent all day with me. He walked me around the property. We walked over to the Walnut Creek Wetland Center. He told the story about growing up in Southeast Raleigh and there always being the smell of sewage because the city was still dumping garbage there as when he was a young man. He talked about one of the reasons he was an environmentalist was because of his experience growing up. And so as Dr. Kemp is spending the entire day with me, I had a vision of four dispensations. Now the first dispensation was the time pre-European engagement. This was when the Suwan, the Catawba, the indigenous people, the Native Americans, the first land people lived in harmony with nature, I call it pristine, whatever the word pristine means in that context. That was the first dispensation. The second dispensation was European contact and really the degradation and destruction of the wetland. The third dispensation was when the city of Raleigh zoned black people to live in an area where it dumped sewage and garbage. And then I envisioned a fourth dispensation where the land that was healed by black people would then work in concert with black people as a way of providing healing to the community. And that finally came into fruition in 2022 with the Healing Garden. We are using therapeutic horticulture and horticultural therapy as a way of addressing the mental health needs, the emotional health needs, not only of the congregation, but of the larger black community. So just to look at terminology a bit, all of us in this room today are therapeutic horticulturists because we can enjoy being in nature. We might not be trained as a therapist, but we find being in nature therapeutic in some way. Now, horticultural therapists are people who have training in therapy, psychology, who also have 
um, horticulturalist bit. So we are using both of those. And it's showing up in our healing garden, which is in our courtyard. We have a number of plant beds. Um, some are raised higher than others so that they are ADA compliant in this context. And we grow uh, a number of fruit and vegetables. And we also have plantings and we work with both therapeutic horticulturalists and horticultural therapists to come in and walk alongside people. So what does this look like? Uh, I would say that the Bible, in our context, is a book called The Well-Garden Mind. Anybody know this text? You know this text. By Dr. Sue Stewart-Smith. She is a, um, a psychiatrist herself, and her partner is a master gardener. And so what does uh, horticulture therapy look like in this context? It looks like somebody entering our courtyard which is completely enclosed. Someone visited and said, so the way you get um, over the, the problem of deer eating your produce <laughs> is that you put it in your courtyard because the deer can't jump over a, a 30 foot roof. <laughs> the, the unintended consequence of being in the courtyard is it immediately disarms. So trauma is defined as being in a constant state of hypervigilance. You're always wondering what's going to happen. When you're, in a, when you're in a courtyard that is enclosed, you enter this space, you don't have to worry about what's behind you because you know what's behind you. It's enclosed. And if you hear the door open, then you know someone's coming in. But if not, then you know you're safe. So just being in the space decreases uh, hypervigilance. If someone is... Um, cultivating or growing carrots, uh, the therapeutic horticulturist may walk beside that person and invite that individual to simply uh, rub her and his hands, or their hands up and down uh, the carrot, feeling the groove. You know, what does that feel like? Uh, we, we use plant memory, rosemary, peppermint is grown, um, inviting people into a sensory exercise to see what association do they have with the, the smell of, of rosemary. So all of these engaging the senses, walking beside people, uh, thinking about ways of how to interrupt trauma, which by definition is by being in a constant state of hypervigilance. How can we, we lower that a bit? Just a couple of other images of the healing garden. And our young people love it. After church, full of full of children um, in the healing garden, picking strawberries, asking what plant is this, what plant is that. These are just a couple of screen grabs from our website. I do invite you to go to our church's website, stambroseraleigh.org, and under work, which is outreach, you'll see a drop-down menu that navigates to our healing garden website. Just last Sunday, we did, for Black History Month, uh, an exercise called Honoring Our Ancestors. Uh, we provided pots. People would paint the pots during church service. And then our horticultural therapist led us in exercises of planting in the pot and then taking the pot home. And, and so we, we honored the ancestors through plant memory. Now this is, a, I think, the third time we've done this. Again, we started in summer of, of 2022, so we're not even two years old as it relates to, to the healing garden. This is what we're doing for the, uh, the spring. April 14th, photography. Um, later this month, we're working with um, a branch of the Audubon Society uh, to do bird watching in Walnut Creek. There's actually a bird watching group made up of, of residents, and so St. Ambrose will participate in that. And as we move into the summer, more programs with gardening together. One of the uh, partnering dioceses, companion diocese with North Carolina, is the Diocese of Botswana, which is an African country just north of South Africa. 
And so we'll have what we call pilgrims from Botswana at least every two years come to North Carolina. And so we hosted some pilgrims from Botswana in November and actually did um, uh, plant memory with them. Um, that even some of the plants uh, that we grew in our garden were similar to the ones that grow in Botswana. And so that, that was a good exercise of plant memory, allowing our parishioners to learn from uh, those from Botswana and vice versa. Just some more, some more pictures of, of the healing garden. In partnering with the city of Raleigh, the city of Raleigh is really looking at our work at St. Ambrose as being a pilot uh, to be introduced into um, the parks and rec uh, throughout the, the city's gardens or um, property. I mentioned earlier about um, the capital campaign. One of the phases for our capital campaign was a new prayer garden and columbarium. And as we were looking at building it, we did so with, with an ecological lens. So we have two rain gardens. There's a 200 square foot rain garden here, a 200 square foot rain garden here. There are 1,000 gallon cisterns behind here, another one here, and the surface is Chapel Hill grit, which uh, is completely porous. And then the columbaria is one here and then one behind. Uh, you can see this is more of an aerial view. One columbaria here, one here. And so as in most Episcopal churches with a high pitched roof, uh, because theologically we're calling it the Ark of Salvation, so it's a ship that's turned, turned upside down. So all of that uh, rainwater from the roof goes to the gutters, which is then piped into the um, cistern, and we use that for drip line irrigation. And it's also worship space. Uh, this is from Epiphany a year ago, so the Epiphany fire. <coughs> Uh, and even Easter, so our Easter sunrise, we have used this space for our uh, Easter sunrise service. Our newly dedicated and consecrated memorial garden and columbarium is another example of how important sustainability and environmentalism are to St. Ambrose. When it rains, water flows from the roof and gathers in this rain guard, meaning that water is allowed to soak into the ground instead of running into the creek. Behind the lattice work, you will find a 2,000 gallon cistern that provides drip line irrigation to the garden. And whenever I see the fig tree in this garden, I'm reminded of Jesus' parable we are to bear fruit. We had um, a new church member in 2018 uh, move from Charlotte to Raleigh. And as I met with her, she was really captivated by the story of St. Ambrose, our response to environmental injustice. And so she wrote an, an e-book called Unearthing uh, Inequity that takes uh, the words from Dr. Camp and takes some of my reflections, newspaper articles, and puts it into uh, this e-book. Again, you can find this um, on our website is also registered with the Library of Congress. So I've talked about water, let's talk about, I've talked about uh, air pollution, let's talk about noise pollution. And so we know that urban areas experience more noise pollution, that makes sense. Uh, we also know that black and brown communities uh, tend to suffer from more, from noise pollution at higher levels more than other communities. And so, a sound engineer at, at NC State, who's African American, a woman, worked with us uh, and set up the instruments you see on the right. These are, this is a sound uh, piece of equipment used to measure decibels. And we had those on our property, I think for almost two months. And, you know, the kids thought it looked like some aliens or something. <laughs> um, and so, Sound Around Town was a sponsoring organization, and she measured the decibel level, and to no surprise, it was higher. You saw the, the interstate, uh, which I mentioned earlier, 
This is a zoomed in view, the interstate that bisects uh, these two historically black communities. And it's not 150 feet from this home to the interstate. And St. Ambrose is just on the, on the other side of that. Heat map. So in 2020, the city of Raleigh did a heat map study. And the thought before the city did the study was that maybe two degrees difference in communities. How many degrees difference do you think Raleigh's found? Ten. ten. Who said ten? <laughs> ten. It floored the city. What they also found is that these areas that had a ten degree difference also happened to be where black and brown people live. So from this map, where do you think black people live? <laughs> surprise, surprise. Here, 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 here. It's where St. Ambrose is. And so this was eye-opening uh, for the city. And one of the reasons for this is the lack of tree canopy. Um, and so when I, I actually preached on this, I said, this is self-evident. Now we do happen to, St. Ambrose is in a Walnut Creek wetland, so there are maybe thousands of water oaks. So we have trees around us. But if you just go to the next neighborhood over, there, there's no trees. And yet you go to more affluent, majority white areas, tons of, of tree canopy. So theology, ecology, and in the public square. Uh, again, as I said, when I came to St. Ambrose in 2012, I talked to Dr. Camp, who told me about flooding. And as I lived in Raleigh, I actually went to undergrad in Raleigh as well as in North Carolina State. I knew that or learned that the Stormwater Commission was the organization that would set the UDO, the ordinances, on the way land must be developed in order to mitigate stormwater. And so as I looked at the stormwater group, I didn't see any black people. I just saw a bunch of white people, uh, mostly male, and those people did not live in Southeast Raleigh. And I said, here we have an organization that is charged with mitigating stormwater run by people who don't live in any area impacted by, by flooding, but rather are making rules that impact me. So I went to the mayor, and I said, you need somebody from this community to be on this board. Uh, and she appointed me to the board. So I appointed in 2019. Um, I have been, I was co-chair the next year. And this is my third year of chairing what we call SMAC. I think the acronym is great, SMAC. Stormwater Management Advisory Commission. And so we concentrate on uh, water runoff, and the impact of stormwater, wherever stormwater finds itself. And the SMAC manages a $14 million budget that is used to do both um, look at the quality, or talk the Q, two Qs, the quality and quantity of runoff. Since I've been chair of SMAC and when I was vice chair, I've been very clear that my top goal is to engineer equity into the system. There is a ranking that SMAC uses to prioritize projects. When you do a map of the projects that have been paid for, it's like the reverse of the heat map. There are all of these projects in mostly white areas, and almost none or very few in historically black areas. And they arrive at these projects by ranking them. And so the top ranked one is the one that gets the money. So we're engineering equity into the system. We're working with a consultant firm out of Atlanta to see how we can take into account um, both uh, past injustices um, and also current realities so that more money as relates to these projects can get into these historically underserved areas. So flooding, noise pollution, air pollution, heat islands, water quality, all of this and more is a part of our reality at St. Ambrose. 
And so from a theological standpoint, if we look at the theological bonds for us. This is how we do baptisms of St. Ambrose. Um, I take a 22-gallon planter, uh, and it's our baptismal font, and as long as the baby can fit in it, we <laughs> baptize naked. We do so because that's how early Christians were baptized, and you get an idea of God's abundance. The baptismal font at the entrance of the church holds about two cups of water. So you have two cups of water compared to 22 gallons. Of what? This idea that uh, God abundantly loves us. When we chrismate, uh, we don't use a thumbprint of oil. We take about a quart of holy oil and we pour it all over the baby's body uh, as it drips into the baptismal font. And then the, the parents, guardians, rub uh, the baby with the holy oil all over. And then I'll take my thumb and take a chest of holy oil and then, then chrismate. Uh, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. We do it that way once you, I mean, you smell uh, the holy oil, you see God's abundance, but we also, in the black context, reclaim the word marked. The word marked is a problematic term for black people. You have theologians, including Anglican bishops, who said black people were marked with the curse of Ham and Canaan from Genesis. And the curse was perpetual servitude, and the marks were dark skin and a wide nose. Black people as enslaved individuals were branded, marked like cattle as property. And in this current day, black people are marked with the bullseye from gun violence, uh, whether gun violence within the community or from law enforcement or other areas. So what we do by chrismating in this manner is that we reclaim the word mark, which for the past half millennium has been negative in the black psyche, and we place it and stake it in Christ. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked, not with the gun, not with the brand, not because you have black skin, but you're marked as Jesus Christ stone forever. So the, the, the connection with baptism and water is, is an easy one, but there's also a theological connection with the Holy Eucharist. We know that in the Eucharist that the ordained person who sets the altar takes a little bit of water and puts it in a chalice. So there's several reasons for that. Uh, wine in the chalice symbolizes the blood of Christ, that's obvious. We know that when Jesus hung on the cross and the soldier pierced his side, what came flowing was both water and wine. Um, water symbolizes us, people, and so when you commingle water with wine, you cannot uncommingle or discommingle. It becomes part of the body, or in this case, the, the blood of Christ. And so, uh, in Jesus becoming human, he does so, as Athanasius said, so that we might uh, become divine. So there's the water association with baptism, and then also the water being commingled in the chalice symbolizing the people. And so when we think about it in that theological context, uh, you didn't have the ministry of water quality and water quantity, uh, which restores humanity, the environment, and the human connectedness, and also at least the water in baptism symbolizing the washing away of sin. So as you move from the theological to the uh, ecological, you move from combing the water and wine to conservation, from chalice to the creek, from baptism to bays, from resurrection to rivers, from Eucharist to estuaries, from asperges to aquatic, from water to water, from congregations to communities. And so to close, just this image from Revelation 22, uh, the river of life, which has uh, a tree that is somehow rooted on either side as the river is running through it. Uh, that is our ultimate goal. That St. Ambrose, uh, we know that we live in a broken world. We know that we will not achieve this until we see Jesus again, and yet we continually work toward that.
Thank you so much, Father Javant. Um, we now have about 20 minutes for questions. Um, Karen and I will be mic runners, so just raise your hand and we'll, we'll come to you. In the back. So who <clears throat> manages and maintains your healing garden? Yes, uh, Kirsten Reberg Horton. Yeah, Kirsten Reberg Horton who is a landscape designer, who is a church member, she is the one who uh, manages it. So we're blessed to have a landscape uh, designer uh, who's a member of the church. But she, and she also is in a graduate school studying to be a therapist. So she's making that transition um, to therapeutic or horticultural therapy as well. And she has a group of volunteers, she's been great in working with the city of Raleigh um, to make sure we have some city support and from the community community as well. So it's just not on one person or, or the congregation, but on a group of volunteers. So another, okay. Thank you, that was really just wonderful and thanks for your great work. Um, um, so my experience is that uh, developers don't actually work in secret, but they certainly don't publicize <laughs> the prep work behind major projects. Um, and I was super impressed that you were aware of that project even going on. Um, shows some political astuteness. Um, how did you figure it out? Like, um, it seems like you got in before city council had moved to all but, you know, approving it. Um, so how did that, how, how are you aware of that? And um, how are you in your congregation continuously aware of political maneuvers by really thoughtful people? Being a community organizing helps. So in the city of Raleigh, which is not the case for all cities, once a project is rezoned, I mean, after then, you, you really have no say. I mean, it has to be something monumental to change it. And so we realized that in Raleigh, Chiefly because we're starting a community organizing group as a part of the Industrial Areas Foundation. And so uh, one of the philosophies of organizing is you have organized people and organized money working together. And so we had a staff with IEF that researched and already knew because they had been working in, in Durham and other major cities how the process worked. And so we knew that if we did not uh, get these considerations in the rezoning, that by the time the backhoes and excavators came, uh, it was too late. I had already built relationships with the mayor and, and several uh, city council members as well as county commissioners as well. And we knocked on doors and we sent emails. We came to county commissioners meetings um, and we were able to get a seat with the developer. Um, and one of the ways that happened um, in this Zoom meeting where the, the executive said there was no stormwater consideration, I used a principle from IEF, which means uh, you always engage with power. So before he got off the Zoom meeting, which was one-sided, so no pe people could not ask questions. You could type in the chat box, you couldn't ask questions. Um, and so in the chat box, I said, <laughs> Um, will you send me your cell phone so we can talk? And he did. And we sat down and we talked. Um, that was that process. Now, to talk about another way that this community organizing is, has worked in our context, we went door to door letting residents know about this project, which the residents did not know. As you said, they, did, they didn't know about this because a developer, underground, stealth, gets rezoned and then you become public. And so as we were talking with residents, we heard person after person say, I cannot afford my property taxes. And we met one individual who said, my grandfather purchased this home. In 2024, I will sell the home because I can't afford the property taxes. And we asked, well, where are you going? I don't know some places I can afford, which is almost an hour away, one or two, two counties over. And so what became very clear to us 
is that property taxes um, were, were impacting the black community more. So we worked with the law firm and did a study, and we found, that, we found out when taxes were reassessed in 2020, that in black communities, the taxes went up in some areas by 400%. And yet, in wealthy white areas, the property taxes went down. And so, we appealed to the county. We went to the county, county staff, county commissioners. We told them the story, and they said, we are so sorry. <laughs> there is nothing we can do. <laughs> Wrong answer. So we kept appealing, and on one hot July Sunday afternoon, we got the county commissioners, the county staff, to come and walk with us. And we walked through a black neighborhood. We said, you see this house right here? Uh, this is Miss Ethel's house. Uh, she's 89. She moved here whatever year. And beside her is this mansion. And this mansion is out facing this, this shotgun house. And so we spent four hours, sweltering heat, walking. That was transformative because the same people who said in February they couldn't do anything by August, say we want to set up seed money, $5 million, to help with property taxes in those areas that have been historically underserved with the, with the promise of increasing that to $40 million for the next fiscal year. So with IAF, we do a power analysis to see where the power is, and then we go to the source of power as a way of, of making change. Because what I tell my folk, it, it's, Churches and nonprofits are interesting. They are perfect service organizations. It's very easy for a church to be a service organization. Thanksgiving comes, you serve turkey plates. Christmas, you set the angel tree. But I'm still moving St. Ambrose from a service-oriented mindset to an organizing mindset. Because I tell my people, you cannot, we as a congregation, cannot serve enough meals to address food insecurity in our community. Um, I have a discretionary fund. People come asking for rent money all the time. I don't have $40 million in my discretionary fund that was housing. But yet we went to power, the, city, the, uh, the county uh, has set up this money and now people can, mostly elderly, can stay in their homes because people organize and move from a service mindset to an organizing mindset. Hey. Well, first off, I want to thank you for lifting us up with this really encouraging information and seeing action rather than just talk about a problem. So um, it wasn't shaming. Well, it's a little shaming. <laughs> it's a lot shaming. But um, I want to thank you for that. I, I'd like to know how we can access more of this to take this back to our communities so we can share as much of this information as possible and hopefully that vision is going to grow. Um, the second thing I want to say is I do a presentation and, um, where I use uh, an Ethiopian quote that you probably know that says, uh, when spiders unite, you can tie up a lion. That's true. And I just love that quote. Anyway, thank you. So go to our website, sanambrosrally.org you can access um, the Healing Pod, Healing Garden, the Labyrinth, um, several articles. Um, you can go to our blog post. So there's a lot of information there. And if not, you can uh, email or call me. Yes. Something I ran into a couple of years ago. Wait for the mic. Uh, something I ran into a couple of years ago was in a Unitarian church. And what they had done is, is removed their And then planted trees between um, uh, car lane, car width uh, trees. And thinking about runoff, uh, and I noticed that your church had a lot of black top around it, that, and I'm trying to think for my own church, <laughs> where we have a lot of black top, um, although we're not. oil and all the, the byproducts of uh, blacktop, but 
it then soaks in and gives um, good uh, uh, moisture to the environment. That's good. The, the way we, we deal with it is we have rain gardens uh, at the end of our parking lot that, that collect the water. But you're right. Anytime you can disrupt uh, the black seed, so this, this parking lot with uh, trees or planting, it, it, it positively impacts the environment. You can also use um, permeable pavers. So, so that's also part of our goal, to take up all of our parking lot and put in either permeable pavers or some type of, of porous yet firm um, uh, surface. <coughs> that will allow water to, to soak in instead of running into Walnut Creek. Um, my name is Kelly, I'm an environmentalist and so forth. So are you actually, what kind of, kind of take, I'm sorry, what kind of certifications have y'all earned additionally by the EPA, and you start portfolio manager, has their energy star, you know, building, have you looked more to be that to be more of that advocacy that for of course, in your face, car white has her cool building, you know, congregation. So, what else is on the on your next to do list? So, you mentioned the EPA. The EPA was uh, at St. Ambrose and Walnut Creek Wetland Park, June, uh, April of last year, so 2023, and designated uh, the Walnut Creek Wetland Park as its 21st um, urban waters partner. So EPA has only given 21 designations in 21 years. And so we are the 21st, which opens up uh, the possibility for funding and partnership. So that's more uh, on the Walnut Creek educational park side, not so much on St. Ambrose side. On St. Ambrose side, we have not looked into some of the things you mentioned, and that would be a growing edge for us. Could you talk about some other um, funding opportunities, maybe on a, on a lower level, not EPA, but, but local places uh, that we that uh, churches could look to for assistance? Definitely look at municipalities. As I mentioned, Raleigh has this um, cost share program uh, related to green stormwater infrastructure, GSI. So your municipality might have th that cost share program as well. Certainly the, the larger Episcopal Church, and all of us know about this, creation care grants, um, diocese uh, may have uh, creation care funding as well. Also corporations, um, I know DuPont, um, and even Lasso, which is the fan manufacturer, um, they, they have funding as well, as, as well as, as Lily. So I, I think starting local, so if you're a municipality, county, um, and then diocese, and then you know panning panning outward. But I I have been impressed, at least from Raleigh's standpoint, how open the city is in working with churches to do cisterns and rain gardens and swells, uh, pavers. The same might exist in, in your area as well. So the water conservation yeah. district some sometimes have. And then um, Audubon at home, if you're in the Northern Virginia area, is working closely with um, faith communities and looking for partnerships. And they've got a little bit of money to help at least with greening landscapes. So that's another possible funding source for you. There's a group called the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. They have um, a kind of group that's gathering Thank you, Father Shaman. Um, I'm wondering, I, I love what you said about the, the capital cam campaign, how you didn't set out to have an ecological campaign, a cam capital campaign, but it sounds like because of a lot of just like formation and parish identity and like you mentioned, like when you saw the heat map, like you mentioned preaching on that heat map. Um, so I'm wondering if you might share with us just like how it sounds like a really holistic kind of like, right? Like it's not just kind of a 
quick little fix. You, you preach one sermon and then all of a sudden environmental justice happens, um, which would be cool, but um, I don't think you're that powerful. Um, but could you maybe say something about like how, how and obviously you've, in, you've inherited a parish with this history, but like what kinds of things have you seen holistically in like Christian formation broadly and preaching? And it just sounds like there's kind of all of those things are firing at St. Ambrose. So I'd, I'd love to hear you share something about that. Thank you for the question. When we look at Christian formation from a child's standpoint, so Sunday school, our Sunday school curriculum is based on ecology. And so part of the curriculum, and I know somebody's gonna ask you what's the name. <laughs> it escapes me, but I can get you the name. Um, part of formation happens in the healing garden. Um, happens on our property. And so that's you know, with, our, with our young people. Um, I, I do preach on any number of subjects that, that impact our community. My whole preaching series for the month of July was on mental health and therapeutic gardens. And so I took the scriptural text, I took uh, the Well Garden Mind and put them together. I worked with uh, the landscape designer who was a member of our church and, and she and I helped craft my sermon series for July. Um, when it comes to, to the liturgy, each month our Aspen Jones intercessory prayer ministry comes up with the theme for the month. And so our litany each month, so the same in each month, Sunday each month, is based on gun violence. Um, May is wetland. Uh, awareness Month, did y'all know such a month exists? No. Oh, yeah, this, this crowd would. Most people, most people know. So, so that, that's a part of it, of it as well. Um, and, you know, I argue, so, so one of the questions I, I often get is, you seem very busy, all of us are very busy, and don't your parishioners critique the fact that you're on stormwater commission, or that you do work or volunteer for the larger church, or to do that you're doing when you're organizing. And my response is, in the black community, that is expected of your minister, no matter denomination. So my people expect me to have a public face and to engage outside of the walls of the church. And so it's expected that I preach on whatever's happening because, I mean, that's what black ministers do. Um, because uh, we are woven into the fabric of, of the community. And so you're right, it, it, is, it is holistic. It's just not from the pulpit, it's how we pray. Uh, it's how we baptize. It's how we celebrate uh, Eucharist. Um, at St. Ambrose, we do not use bleach white hopes. We do not use bleach white hopes. Uh, what is it like to put bleached white hopes into a black hand? And why are we chasing purity and putting it in terms of whiteness? What is it like for the celebrant to stand at the altar, to hold a bleached white host and say, repeating the words of Jesus, this is my bleached white body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Wrapped in what I call righteousness. This idea of righteousness and white are joined together. So we use whole wheat hopes, um, which is becoming harder to find. With it, it's becoming harder to find. We can't get it from out. Yeah, you bake your own bread. Um, we probably should move, move in that, that to get move in that direction. Um, so it, it's even in, in, in you know the bread. It's it's in the images that are on the wall. Uh, it's in the the theologians that I reference. Uh, a lot of womanist theologians, a lot of Eastern Orthodox. Um, it's in how we look at light and dark, that we don't fall into um, biblical language on the dichotomy of light and dark. It's been a perfect vehicle for racism. The fact that there's only one scripture in all of the Sunday lectionary that lifts up a positive image of darkness. All the other images of darkness you hear read on Sunday are negative. When you look at the lectionary itself, 
as we will do soon. The Ten Commandments is read twice in a three-year lectionary cycle. When the Ten Commandments are read, it's Exodus chapter 20. Uh, the chapter 20 is 21 verses. So both times we read almost all verses, 20 verses. But the lectionary leaves out the 21st verse, which says, As Moses received the Ten Commandments, he withdrew to the thick darkness where God lived. Well, if God is in thick darkness, that's got to be positive space. I want to be in that space. What are we doing at St. Ambrose? When the Ten Commandments comes up, we read the whole chapter. <laughs> yeah. Then I take the 21st verse, and I lift up darkness, and I preach through one of the commandments, to one of the commandments through this lens of positive darkness. So, holistic. It's just not pigeonholed. At the back. I like all the way back, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your work, all your vision. Um, one thing I wanted to say um, is that on this website of homegrownnationalpark.org is a science curriculum that has been designed and uh, vetted. It's called Symbiotic Schoolyard. And it's now available to everybody across the nation. You can just go on homegrownnationalpark.org and you can get it. It's got all the handouts for kids in the middle school grades to learn about it. And not only do they learn about um, nature, ecology, etc. in the classroom, but part of the curriculum is to go out into the schoolyard and recapture the uh, some of the land and learn how to plant, etc. So it's an extension of the great work that your community, you and Walnut Creek in particular, and St. Ambrose is doing. And right here, and it's got all the, and also I'm just looking at time, but how much? Uh, by, by maybe one more question, since so it's the last one. First, again, thank you for your presentation. Just amazing, worth getting out of bed and coming here this morning. <laughs> um, very educational and inspiring. I have many questions, but I was just asked two. Is the large stadium development still going to go in very close to your property? And when I looked at the map of the wetland, it looked like within the wetland is NC State. If so, what role is that major icon within Raleigh for what I think of the role NC State University plays in the Raleigh landscape, I didn't hear a lot of them participating in these initiatives. So I'd be interested to know what role they play. Yeah, you, you asked a very good question. So I'm, a, I'm an alumnus of, of NC State Mechanical Engineering. And um, NC State is doing uh, a fair job of trying to right the wrongs. This autoclave machine, yeah. we, we guess, imagine it came from NC State. We can't prove it. Um, <laughs> so the design of the Walnut Creek, let me just use this. The design of the Walnut Creek um, Wetland Park was done via NC State. So NC State, um, engineers and, and landscape architecture, school of architecture did that. Um, and I, I'm having a hard time finding this. I guess it's not important, we're moving on. Here we go. There we go. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, more, more needs to be done. Um, NC State just proposed to the city council um, rezoning for 200 acres. Strato Walnut Creek. Uh, what, would, what would the university do with that? It's unclear. Um, 
So even though strides have been made regarding um, NC State's impact on Walnut Creek, more work needs to be done. Um, so that somewhat answers your question. And your first question escaped me. It was around oh, the, the, the development. Story. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, development. We knew we could not stop that. That that's happening. That the, yeah, we so we were up front that yes, we want to stop this. That is not happening because our city council is in partnership with business. Mm -hmm. What's good for business yeah. is good for Raleigh. So we knew that was happening. We knew the best thing we could do was to bake in stormwater consideration, um, which happened. We wanted affordable housing and workforce development. Those two didn't, we didn't get the level we wanted, but it's still going in. Now the stadium is on pause for a bit. It was meant to be a, a soccer stadium. I think eventually it will happen, but this development is 30 years <coughs> in the making, um, which is so impressive that in 2020, a city council rezones something that won't be completed until 2050. But imagine, you know, the downstream impact. So yeah, this is this is on. They've already started uh, developing um, parcel one, which is the top left. Thank you so much, Father Jamon. Can we all give him a warm round?